Then the Pharisees going, consulted among themselves how to ensnare him in his speech. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The Pharisees and the Herodians went out and consulted among themselves to try to ensnare our Lord. Now the word is ensnare used in the Greek in this verse is related to the Syriac word, which means to catch like a bird. In fact, uh, Saint, uh, or excuse me, Cornelius Labide in his commentary on today's gospel uh, says the following referring to this. He says, For just as they catch birds with the snare, so the cunning catch the simple with a deceitful question. The Pharisees put captious questions to Christ, questions that would entrap him or capture him, with the design that whatever way he might answer, he should incur blame and that he would be, as it were, trapped by his own answer, so that that he could be captured and refuted by it and be guilty of the charge of treason against either human or divine majesty. Close quote, Cornelius Lapidae. Well, they were trying to trap him. You see, they knew they had him in a corner. If he answered one way, they'd have him. If he answered another way, they'd have him. Now, St. Augustine here says, quote, They laid a plot by means of a dilemma. So whichever, should choo- so whichever he would choose of its two horns, he might be caught. If he answered that it was lawful, he would be destroyed as an enemy to Caesar. So these were not nice people. They were the wise ones. They were the rich, the crafty. Well, our Lord was a simpleton, so they thought. They were going to trip him up so that they can condemn him. They wanted to gain a mastery over our Lord by craftiness, by guile and deceit. Now, these actions of the Pharisees are, in fact, sins against the virtue of prudence. So first we have to ask, well, what is prudence then? Well, St. Thomas says that it is, quote, the divinely infused virtue by which one exercises proper counsel and judgment and through practical reason commands the will to act through a means to a man's supernatural last end. Close quote, St. Thomas. That's a pretty big uh, definition, but uh, we'll, we'll break that down. Well, basically, a virtue, all it is is a good moral habit. And this one, the virtue of prudence is properly in the intellect. In fact, that's the one that it builds up. But then we have it, the fact that it's divinely infused, that it's given to us. So whenever we're in the state of grace, we have this virtue. But then, of course, we have to practice it or we're going to lose it. Now, of course, this is uh, where we exercise proper judgment and then we make uh, proper acts of the intellect. Now, also in this virtue, we take counsel so that we can judge correctly from true moral principles and also the counsel that we've received from those that know so that we command the will to act properly. This is prudence. Prudence is always asking the question, what do I need to know so that I can practice virtue well. So prudence always asks that question. So back to craftiness, guile, and fraud of today's gospel. Well, St. Thomas tells us that they are sins of excess against prudence. Now, strictly speaking, we can't commit sin by excess against prudence in the sense that uh, we can never have too much prudence. But what St. Thomas is talking about is that um, there are moral actions, he says, which parade under the guise of prudence and have an unfortunate similarity to it. This prudence by excess is called false prudence. Now, this vice is associated with the means, that is, the things that we're doing to achieve a final end. Now, these means, whether good or evil, uh, are ordered to a supernatural end, or excuse me, an end which is either good or evil, and this would be the vice. So for a thing to be good in and of itself... All the means have to be good, and the end itself has to be good. If any one of these is bad, it renders the whole action bad. So in other words, if I'm doing all these means to obtain a bad end, then it means that I'm doing an evil act, even though the means may be good to get to that final end. But if I'm doing an end that is evil, but all the means are good, or even if one of the means are bad along the way, then it renders the whole act evil. Now, this is where we get the, uh, the understanding of the ends justify the means. If we're trying to do something uh, it, that the end we think is good, but the means that we're going about it is sinful, 
then uh, the, the act itself is sinful. So the end never justifies the means. Because I know we've heard that statement before uh, because it is a very uh, prominent worldly statement. You know, the end justifies the means. Well, no, it never does because it violates prudence. Well, craftiness is such a sin against prudence by excess because it is con- concerned, as St. Thomas says, with the use of evil means for the attainment of an end that might be good in itself. Now, a perfect example of this was a couple of weeks ago when we had the, uh, the gospel of the unjust steward. Now, our Lord commended the man. He said, the scripture tells us, quote, and the master commended the unjust steward in that he acted prudently, close quote scripture. Now, obviously, what we're talking about here is the, uh, the vice of worldly prudence, that is, prudence that is not based on something supernatural, that it's trying to do something on the natural level. So, again, our Lord isn't condoning the evil done by the steward, But the master in Christ's parable can admire this unjust steward for seeking what he saw as a good end, that is, security for his future. But he was going about it in an evil way. And this is obviously a worldly thing that we call carnal prudence. And St. Thomas says that it is a sin by excess. You know, it's, it's, um, it's doing things using too many worldly means. Um, now, whenever we use wiles and intrigues to get what we want, for example, by lying, human respect, Flattery, fear, coercion, accusations to get what we want, even if the reason appears good to us, then we're guilty of this sin. Now, the Pharisees in today's gospel were using human respect. They were using flattery to try to lure our Lord first. He said, Master, we know that thou art a true speaker, and you teach the ways of God in truth. Neither do you care for any man, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore. Okay, they set up the question. Then they ask the question because they're trying to entrap our Lord. Cunning, deceit, human respect. All these things are being utilized here. Now, St. Thomas tells us that whenever craftiness takes the form of words, it's called guile. When craftiness takes the form of deeds, it's called fraud. But our Lord answers them honestly. But not just with honesty. He also answers them with simplicity. And he shows us the true virtue of prudence because he gets right to the truth. He gets right to the truth of the matter. And without worrying about what others think or what they're going to be saying about him, he directs them to the truth. Now, it sounds harsh, but he loves them. Remember, God wants all men to be saved. And so he must correct them rather sternly for their guile and their craftiness. Our Lord says, why do you tempt me, you hypocrites? He gets right to the truth of the matter. Now, it's as though he said, and I'm just quoting the words of Cornelius Lapide, it's though he said, you pretend to be friends and to desire to be religious and to maintain a good conscience, that you may know what is right and just for you to do in this case, according to the law of God, when all the while you are my enemies and God's also and are thirsting for my blood and are trying by fraud and deceit to extort it from me. Close quote Cornelius Lapide. So our Lord points to this craftiness and guile. Now, St. Jerome here says, quote, The prime virtue in one who gives an answer is to know the mind of him who asks the question and to adapt the answer accordingly. So he has to understand those that are speaking to him, and that's what our Lord does. So he catches them. That's why he says, you hypocrites. He identifies this. Now, by their actions and their words, they're actually revealing more to our Lord about themselves then in the accusations they're leveling against him. This is why our Lord gets right to the point. So what is the solution to such faults of guile, deceit, and craftiness? Well, they're actually very simple. Truth, honesty, simplicity. The words of our Lord where he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the devil. So just honesty. We have to have a spirit of humility. And we also have have to have a docility of mind. You see, humility keeps us honest and resigned to God's holy will, how we set things up, and also our situation in life, honesty with our, our vocation. Docility is a readiness to learn and the ability in listen it, and to listen and to be taught. Now, pride is obviously going to be the biggest obstacle to this, you know, where we think, well, I know better. There will be intellectual pride. And this hurts that docility because docility always desires to know. 
to always do the right thing. Because remember, prudence is about knowing things in the practical intellect so that we can actually do the right thing. We must also have what St. Thomas calls circumspection, which is an ability to look around and consider the circumstances of our surroundings and to know our place. To look at the environment to see what our boundaries are rather than usurp something that isn't properly ours. Then an ability to apply all these things truthfully, honestly, and with humility. So basically, prudence is the solution to all these faults. Prudence helps us to take proper counsel and listen through docility and humility, and then judge well and apply the proper and virtuous means uh, that we, so that we can act well. Now, all this is very important, especially in looking at today's gospel. And so our Lord applies all these things that we just talked about, all these solutions uh, to guile, to deceit, and craftiness. So our Lord asks the question, Whose inscription is on this coin? Of course, they say Caesar's. Truth, honesty, docility, simplicity. Our Lord has cut right to the center of the point. He has taken what they said and applied a judgment to it. So he says, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give back to God what belongs to him. Now, obviously, our Lord and the apostles had very uh, very little in their possession, so there was very little that they could render, actually, to Caesar. But this is also kind of our Lord's point. He's speaking spiritually here about detachment and also uh, of rendering God all that he's given us. And so I'll quote St. Hilary on this particular aspect of the gospel. He says, quote, If we have nothing in our possession which belongs to Caesar, then we are free from the obligation of giving him that which is his. But if you wish to retain the things that are yours by attachment, and among them coins minted by Caesar, and you were commanded as his subject to support the burdens of state, then by all rights it is fair that you render them to him as if they were his. Close quote, St. Hilary. So the moral lesson our Lord is teaching us is prudence, humility, docility, and simplicity. The reason why is that we may always speak wisely among deceitful men and moderate our speech so as not to offend any party, but also not to fear correction on our own part. Now, we, our Lord asked us to give us our heart, get to give him our hearts, our souls, and our mind. We have to love him with our whole heart, our whole mind, and our whole soul. This God who sees all things. Now, in all of this, that our Lord is speaking of. We keep virtue to ourselves, but detach ourselves from the world. We render to God what is His, and to Caesar what is Caesar's, by leaving all the things of the world. So let us leave the world's guile and deceit aside, and in the words of our Lord, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all things will be added. We need to be virtuous, to be holy, to be prudent, and all things will be added unto you. Leave the world's things. Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. May God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.